Head injuries, in a nutshell, you can't do a lot with them. Maintain the airway, ventilate the patient. I mean, you know, major head injuries, uh, they probably need to be intubated. So ALS-wise, that's what you need. You need to consider if you start looking at these head injuries, okay? Because more than likely they need to be intubated. This is a skull fracture, right? So the bone, the skull is obviously a bone. So it can fracture just like any, they're repairing this one with the, the screws and stuff. Okay, uh, this area here would be the scalp. So if it's considered, this injury here is considered a flap. If this took place, you know, in the accident, it was a flap. So they took this part of the scalp and just sort of flapped it up, okay? Notice how thick it is here. There's a lot of tissue, soft tissue on the, on the head. It's just all nice and, and compressed down. If you had this particular flap, you'd want to look for, you'd want to inspect the skull, okay? And then look for fractures. That would make a huge difference on where you transported this patient. A flap like this could be transported to like a level three. Uh, maybe a level four, all they're going to do is put uh, staples in it. They'll clean it up, put staples back in it, okay? A skull fracture would require level one trauma center, okay? So you look here, skull fracture, obvious skull fracture, you look for the broken bone. A depressed fragment would mean that this part of the skull would fracture and depress into the, into the uh, cavity. Whether or not it's into the brain or not, we don't know, but it's depressed, so it's depressed into the, the cavity. And then here's just another nice picture looking at the, the, the other layers of, uh, you know, you know, it's yummy. Mm. Okay, so most, like I said, most of the time you've got to, uh, they, they, they are, if they have a bleed, it's potentially life-threatening, okay? It, it probably is life-threatening, all right? So what takes place here, what's very important as an EMT, what you would do is prompt recognition. Hey, this person has a head bleed. They need ALS. They need a level one trauma center, okay? And then uh, to expedite that, that sort of continued care, okay? It, it's very important. If you don't recognize it, just like someone having a heart attack, you don't recognize it, what's going to happen? Huh? Yeah, they don't fall over in their turkey Christmas Day. You don't recognize the pops having a heart attack? Feels over in his turkey, okay? Right? Trust me, I've seen it a lot. That they would, ah, it's just indigestion, it's indigestion. And all of a sudden, you know, we're pulling them out of their gravy. But the, uh, the, so you have to recognize these different, with the medical emergencies and, and the trauma. So when we get into chest trauma, like a, a cardiac tamponade, can't do anything about it, but you need to recognize it. It's, it's a big thing to make sure that you recognize, both in test land, taking the test, and uh, with patient care. Okay? The base of the skull is the weakest part, so you get these these fractures at the base of the skull. As I was looking through here, one thing that didn't really uh, mention is the, it hit man, I have to look back, but a, the, a basilar skull fracture has two very classic signs uh, that you can see. One's called periorbital bruising, where it's bruising around the eyes, both eyes, and it's, uh, the slang term is raccoon eyes. So they get the raccoon eyes around here, and then mastoid bruising, <clears throat> bruising or battle signs, the mastoid process right here, and they get bruising behind the, the mastoid process. Very two <clears throat> classic signs of a, that the base of the skull is fractured. The other one is leaking of cerebral spinal fluid through the nose and the ears, okay? So those are very two sort of really clear uh, <clears throat> signs that you can see. Remember all the spinal nerves and, and uh, the nerves and blood vessels, they go uh, 
they go up and, and through the, 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 uh, the holes in the bottom of the skull so that they can become damaged as well. Again, back to reviewing the anatomy. Uh, review your anatomy. Make sure that you're familiar with the, the bones of the face uh, in, in the skull. Uh, most of them that you are. Cerebral spinal fluid acts as that cushion, right? And it can leak out of the of the uh, ears and nose. An old school way of measuring, see if that's, so you have this patient, you suspect they have a uh, basic skull fracture or a head injury, they have like this little snotty looking fluid leaking out of their nose, and you go, hmm, what if that's cerebral spinal fluid or snot, right? Uh, one way that you can tell, and uh, it's an old school way, you take your 4x4, four four, not like 4 foot by, but 4x4, four four, right? And you take the corner of it and you dip it in the, in the fluid leaking from the nose, right? So you get a little spot over here, on there, and you set it aside for a minute or two, and then you pick it back up, and if it's cerebral spinal fluid, it's going to develop this gold ring around it. Okay, and, and it's called a halo test. How do you spell halo? H A L O. Yeah, halo test. Like the gold, you know, like the little angel. Halo, right? You get that? Okay, so you get the halo test here. The more modern way to do it is get your glucometer and put a, uh, a strip in there and suck some of that fluid up in the glucometer and if it produces uh, glucose then it's uh, cerebral spinal fluid. If it's no glucose or very very low glucose reading then it's not. Alright so uh, a couple different ways this the halos test is is pretty old but you do get that with the basic skull being fractured. Go in through how do you say this word by the way? Huh? Meninges. Meninges. Okay, the different layers of the skull again. Anatomy. You, most of you guys are in anatomy, right? Yeah. So you got that licked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey. Hey. Oh. Sorry. It's ham page term paper. Now that's a quirky Yeah. Uh, learn, learn your anatomy. It's in your book. Memorization. Learn the different layers of the. How you said it? Meninges. 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 Okay. The bones and the structure. The the different bleeding. Now we have a subdural bleed, an epidural bleed, and a, a subarachnoid bleed are the three major types. And and we addressed these when we talked about hemorrhagic stroke, right? Because the same thing. The, the bleed is a bleed. A head bleed is a bleed. Whether it's through a hemorrhagic stroke or getting hit upside the head by a three iron. Okay, it's still bleed, bleeding inside the skull. Just by definition, the bleeding that between the dura mater and the skull is an epidural bleed. The epidural bleed is a sudden onset because it involves an artery. So you're going to see these signs and symptoms that we're going to talk about really quick. Okay, so the headache, the dizziness, the nausea, vomiting, loss of consciousness. Right, elevated blood pressure. You're going to see all these uh, amnesia. You're going to see these uh, all very quickly. Signs and symptoms are going to be produced very quick. Okay. Uh, subdural bleeds between the dura, uh, beneath the dura, subdural, right? So, and it's usually venous. So some of these can take up to like 12 to 48 hours before they start you start seeing these signs and symptoms. Okay? If it's a huge vessel, then you'll see it right away. Okay. And the arachnoids between the surface of the brain, or the arachnoid membrane and the surface of the brain. So it just depends on really where the bleed is coming from, but it doesn't matter that much because a bleed is a bleed. Okay, it just depends on which vessel is ruptured and how fast the signs and symptoms are going to occur, right? 
and again just the different layers so just sort of refresh your memories we learned this last year okay so uh, refresh there the cerebrum controls all of the the main functions the, the gross motor skills the big functions of the uh, the body the cerebellum fine motor skills uh, and the brain stem uh, the autonomic functions including the respiratory function which is a, a lot that we'll see with brain stem injuries Scalp injuries, it's just soft tissue, right? But one thing with the scalp injury, if you've ever seen one, they bleed like crazy. Okay. I've walked up to patients with scalp lacerations, and it look, it's a blood bath. They have blood all over them, it's all over them. You know, just like going, oh, wow. You know, and they have hair, so it's hard to see. But when you start digging in their hair, sometimes it's already sealed up. The bleed's already stopped. Okay. But they bleed a lot, and... This says because they don't constrict very well, like a, a bigger vessel. So scalp injuries can really bleed. We talked about the problem with anchoring some sort of the, the bandaging part of it, right? You know, you don't want to go up underneath the chin, so it's, it's difficult sometimes to get the right amount of pressure on it. And they do bleed. Uh, the flaps, they'll bleed till you staple them. Right? They just bleed and bleed. Uh, not profusely like, like buckets, but they do they do bleed a lot. Okay, so that's some of the problems with uh, scalp injuries. We talked about depressed skull fractures. Make sure that if you have an open uh, scalp injury that you and you can visualize the skull, then you look for fractures. You look for depressed skull fractures. The same way with any bone, it can be open or closed. All right, and uh, if there's enough damage to fracture the skull, more than likely that energy is transferred through there and you, you, you could have some sort of injury into the brain or the bleed, okay? So those things are important to look for or to consider, okay? Like I said, any kind of skull fracture, depressed or just a, like that left, that picture of linear skull fracture needs a level one trauma center. The problem with injuries, brain injuries or injuries like to the, uh, with the bleeding is swelling, swelling due to that, that pressure. You have the skull, it doesn't move, it's, it won't expand. So as, as the patient bleeds into the skull, it puts a lot of pressure down to the brain, the brain stem, lead to brain stem herniation, okay? Uh, the brain is soft like butter, stick butter, right? And so, and blood is acidic. It doesn't like it in there. It's not good for the tissue. Uh, and then traumatic brain injury, they, they abbreviated TBI. What's, what's TMV? Traumatic neck injury. M? We get neck. Oh, wait, yeah. you said M. Yeah. T? Tango Mike Bravo for you ROTC people. TMB. You never heard that. We talked about it last year. What? Where's your young memories at? Apparently it's gone. <laughs> Patient died from TMB. Too much beer? That could be it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Too much blood? What? <laughs> Too many birthdays. Uh, uh, oh, that was lame. That was lame. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. We have to remember the important abbreviation. Right there, right there. TMB. Okay. Uh, too many birthdays. Too many beers. 
<laughs> Could be a wreck, right? <laughs> Patient wrecked, fell over, hit his head. I've seen this. The guy fell down the talk about head injuries, okay? He fell down a flight of stairs. He's laying there completely unconscious. We get there, the police officer is sitting over the top of him looking at it like that. And he goes, we walk up, and we're like, hey, you know, we're sizing everything up, general first impression, we're going, like, what's going on? And I said, I think he fell down those stairs because his beer bottle was over there. <clears throat> by the end of, by the stairs, and I'm like, great. See if he's unconscious. Did we talk about the hand drop test? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he picked his hand up, held it over his face, and it went, bam, hit him right in the face. It's like, yep, he's unconscious. <laughs> We should probably do something. Uh, <laughs> ended up intubating him and flying him to Dallas. I mean, he was, he, he either was really, really drunk because I didn't use any sort of sedative to intubate him. He didn't have no gag reflex. So he's really, really drunk. Or he had this pretty bad head injury that we didn't never find out. So, no. He, he could have died from too many beers. <laughs> Secondary to falling down a flight of stairs. Okay, so now we got all the important ones out of the way. So what's what's the bleeding? Okay, uh, penetrating trauma, blunt force trauma, any any type of trauma to the head could be closed or open. So the uh, remember that energy is just transferred into the. The head. Here's some pictures. You know, get hit with a baseball. That would do it, especially in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe. That's a pulse point, by the way. If you don't know that, you can feel your temporal pulse right here. This is a very thin uh, piece of tissue. Uh, the what? No, not a dark night. That was Batman, right? Yeah. There's this, there's this other dude that was a pretty popular actor. They had a, uh, a fake gun, a cat um, gun. Oh, uh, no, uh, we talked about it then, so he told us. Yeah, they stuck it up to his temporal lobe and squeezed the trigger, and it caused an air embolism in there, uh, and it killed him. Yeah. So, uh, very, very thin, get hit in the temporal lobe, it's, it's, it's life threatening, even with like something like a baseball. All right. So, uh, open fractures, you can get penetrating, lacerations. So, we look at this, and I'll just read this off because it's, the, the writing is so small, right? Uh, decreased mental status, unconscious, unresponsive, deformity here on the skull. Right, cerebral spinal fluid, discoloration, we talked about that, uh, raccoon eyes, okay, unequal pupils, bring that back up in a minute when you get a blown pupil, you get one pupil on one side that's dilated and one that's normal or constricted, all right, that's a, called a blown pupil, and it's a uh, sign of a brainstem herniation, almost all the time, okay, so the, uh, Respiratory changes, we get the, you know, we got, talk about Cushing's triad. Remember, uh, irregular respirations, the shame stoked respirations, the fast, uh, deep breathing with periods of apnea, uh, and then uh, hypertension and bradycardia is the, uh, the Cushing's triad. Most of the time, when you, when you have that Cushing's triad, it, it's like when you know somebody and you say both of their names, you know, that person is, you don't want to be around. So if you say all three names, like, oh, who, who's Hannibal Lecter? You know, they never call him Hannibal, right? They always call him Hannibal Lecter. You don't want to be around that guy, right? So, Christians try it when you say three, it's, it's always bad. Uh, you know what I'm talking about with the names, right? When you say someone's first and last name all the time, you refer to them first and last name, it's usually somebody that you don't want to be uh, like called in the office on. No? Clueless? 
That's right, you would want to. Jacqueline Wood, oh no, I don't want to go see her. Uh uh. No, never. Right? But. Okay, move on. Sensory motor deficits, posturing, you get uh, uh, concordant posturing, deservant posturing, right? So you get these different things from, from head injuries. They break it down into like a primary head injury, okay? Uh, where, you know, direct impact, acceleration, deceleration, coup, contra coup. Uh, remember last year we had that little video, it wasn't that, it just replay, what do you call them things that replay over and over? Mm -hmm. the, the, like a, what? A what? A GIF or oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. You, sl you slap the head and the little brain moved inside and kept slapping the head and the little brain moved inside. Okay. Coup contra coup injury is when the brain sort of moves forward and moves backwards. Coup and contra coup uh, injuries where the brain moves back and forth, sort of sloshes around in there. Ooh. And if you're familiar with the, the skull, it's not smooth. It has all these processes that you will have to eventually memorize, not here, but when you take the anatomy, you'll have to memorize all those processes in the base of that skull and all those holes, they have names, okay? And so the, uh, and there's a bunch of them. So that causes injury to the brain, directly to the brain, as the brain sort of sloshes over those processes. It, it can lacerate the brain or contu have a contusion, okay? Some things that we look at, hypoxemia. Are we familiar with that word? What's it mean? Arterial blood, right? Mm -hmm. Hypoxia is tissue, right? Yeah. Hypercarbia, that's the right thing. Uh, 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 How much carbon? Uh, uh, Black. Hypoglycemia. So glucose, high, hyper, hyperthermia. So it's pretty. So these are things that, that are that you can, that would worsen this brain injury, okay? A lot of times you get the brain injury by uh, the hyper, uh, excess carbon dioxide because of the respiratory rate. It doesn't, the body builds up CO2, and so you have to get the CO2 off, right? So if you suspect this patient has an increase of CO2 because of this head injury, how do you remove the CO2? Yes, and by what? How, how what rate? Okay, how do we remove the CO2? How do, how do we remove CO2 from the body? Exhale. So if we have a buildup in CO2, what do we need to do? Breathe faster. Yeah, breathe faster. We need to hyperventilate, correct? Yeah. So what would you do to remove CO2 from your patient? You would back them out of rate of... Hyperventilate. Right. About a rate of 20. Okay. Remember, 12 to 20. Really, 20 is on the fast end. Okay. We, we, we would ventilate an unconscious person at a rate of 10. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Every six Mississippis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 20 is rather fast. Even though it's, it fits into the normal 12 to 20, you sitting there, you're only really breathing about 14 to 16 times per minute. So 20 is, 20 is hyperventilating, okay? If you want to get technical, go to 24, but around 20, 24, okay? Uh, to, remove the, to remove the CO2, check, make sure that they, they have an adequate airway that they remember good rise and fall of the chest. Okay? Adequate respirations, good rise and fall of the chest. Good chest wall movement. Okay? You, you've got to be careful on a written exam, you know, uh, look minimal chest wall movement or inadequate respirations. You know, this this is an indication for a bag valve bath. Okay? Uh, 
evaluate the need for oxygen. If they're even in trauma, if they're above 94, no outward respiratory distress, no need for oxygen, right? The American Heart Association deems that unhealthy, even in the trauma patient, right? If the pressure keep them warm, right? Because we can't clot, the body doesn't clot very well when it's cold. Keep them warm, treat them for shock, make sure that they're do a D-stick, right? We do a D-stick on anybody that has an altered mental status. Even if we're for sure we know why, we would still do a, an, an altered mental uh, D-stick, correct? Yeah. You know, if the guy has long pupil, you know, the corticate posturing, agonal respirations, cerebral spinal fluid leaking out his nose, we're like, boom, head injury. He's unconscious, we'd still do a D-stick. Uh, always do a D-stick. Okay. And always consider ALS. They can have life-threatening seizures with that. Uh, the patient needs to be, the patient I just talked about, they need to be intubated, right? So they need ALS treatment. They, the, the difference is you can ventilate the patient, but they, on, on the ALS side, they can intubate, secure the airway, but they can monitor CO2. So they know if they have a CO2. They do CO2 monitoring, in tidal CO2. So they're monitoring the CO2 once they get the patient intubated. And they can bag the patient at a rate according to adjust the CO2. Okay? Done a gazillion times. Watch the monitor, bag the rate, patient according to the CO2. Uh, from Greenville to Parkland, it's about a 15-minute flight, and uh, we, we picked up a patient that they were hyperventilating, but they were like 30 times a minute. We got there and they were doing this. We were like, slow, slow, slow your ventilations down. Okay. No, really, slow your ventilations down. Okay. And we finally just took over, we got the patient in the helicopter, hooked up to the in title CO2, 15 minutes, we would be sitting there going, we talked about what, once every six Mississippis? Squeeze the bag and go, so what are we gonna have for dinner tonight? Netflix time, blah, 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 blah. Beautiful day to fly. Like once every I don't know, it's just very slow to bring that uh, to bring that CO2 level back up. They, they hyperventilated this patient where they had their CO2 level so low that we just had to stop breathing for the patient to get their CO2 level back. And I forget now, we <coughs> actually counted it, forgot the number now, but it wasn't very many times in the 15-minute flight that we we were squeezing that bag because we were trying to get the CO2 level back. They need oxygen, but they need their CO2 level to be correct as well, right? Okay, so brainstem herniation uh, due to the bleed or, or whatever is where the uh, brainstem, due to the pressure or something, is forced down through the for Raymond, misspelled, mispronounced that for like 20 years, for Raymond Magnum, okay, uh, the hole in the bottom of the skull, so that brainstem is forced down through there. The pressure of the brainstem and everything, that's where you get all the bad side effects. The irregular breathing, the blown pupil, uh, the, the optical nerve runs down through there as well, and it's, it's compressed, makes that pupil uh, blow okay. Most everybody that I can remember that has been herniated uh, has died. Okay, they're a uh, matter of fact, uh, I've been really known, but a bunch of people knew got hit on a bike and had brain stem injury and he ended up dying. Okay, he wasn't quite DRT, but that brain injury sort of made him that way. Okay, so but the uh. Most everybody, I haven't met too many people 
there's a brain stem herniation. So that's where you get the, like we talked about, you get the uh, blown pupil, the paralysis, definitely unconsciousness, okay? Uh, in this Cushing's reflex, you get what the Cheyenne Stokes respirations, very fast, deep respirations with period of apnea, okay? Then they have Cushing's, the Cushing's triad, they go into the hypertension. That hypertension is like 200, right? In bradycardia, you know, 50s or so. Those are things to look at. Besides so that, we treat it like an open, just like any other wound. Open, is it open or closed as far as the fractures are concerned, right? Do I, you, you have a fracture to the skull, you can't really splint it. Right? So you put dry steel dressing on top, try to control the bleeding, uh, if you can. Shearing or tearing, this is this sort of a new word for me, the fuse. What did you say that was? Axonal. Axonal injury, okay. Anyway, where it shears or tears, the nerve fibers in, in the brain, okay, with its no transmission. Uh, we can't put back together spinal nerves or uh, the, uh, the spinal nerves. They're, we're going to figure it out, or the, the really, really, really smart people haven't figured out the sheath problem with it yet. They haven't been able to put those back together. Peripheral nerves you can put back together. These, uh, not necessarily. And it can be just in the, the concussion as well, okay? So these are things that a simple head injury such as a concussion can, can have this. As, uh, the concussion, I've seen people with concussions, they, they've had ringing in the ears and headache, nausea, vomiting for weeks, you know, and, until it... Uh, it, it just finally went away, you know, sort of self, self-corrected. Bleeding. Now this is, see, this is different. What? What? Well, the the head injury's closed, but this is a soft tissue. This is out of his ear. See his ears lacerated into the back of his neck. Or sort of a back part of the neck there. Uh, you you want to cover that? Remember we talked about those open neck injuries. You can still get a air embolism. That's a huge laceration. Okay. Uh, one thing we talked about when you're bleeding from the ear, not the ear bleeding itself, but in the ear canals, the blood or the fluids coming out the ear canal. Uh, that's a, that's just a soft tissue injury there. The way that you would want to take it there. Uh, open, can you see the, you can sort of see a little bit of skull right there, right? Looks like you got hit. What, what would cause that? Could be, could be a three iron. Sure. Hit. Hit up on me, huh? <laughs> All right. Concussion. Uh, NFL really brought concussions back to the, the forefront, right? You can get most of these signs and symptoms in a concussion, except the cushion's triad, okay? So all these signs and symptoms that we're talking about, you can get those in a concussion except the uh, the Cushing's triad confusion be unresponsive headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting I'd like to talk about over a period of time things are going things are going to improve you know they have that protocol now the concussion protocol that most everybody in sports go through okay Contusion or, or, or bruise, okay? Just it's bruising and swelling. You get s swelling in the brain. Uh, like we spoke of a minute ago, the coup contra coup injury. 
acceleration or deceleration, you're going really fast and it's that sudden stop, okay, that you hit. So you have a vehicle like passed me this morning, you know, they, they accelerate real fast and all of a sudden they don't see the big truck in front of them and then splat, then it happens uh, this morning. But that is the potential, you know, you go around me at 90 but and get in the other lane, but there's a truck there. So they would have hit the back end of that truck. That would have been a sudden stop at 90 miles an hour. Oh. So a deceleration injury probably would have been fatal. Okay, but so these are some ways you can get the uh, contusions. The big thing, just like every every time, know the vocabulary, right? Know know what uh, they're talking about. The subdural hematoma. Remember, the hematoma is a collection of blood. You know, so if you had a hematoma on your leg, it would be a collection of blood under under the skin of the leg. This is the uh, collection of blood between the dura matter and the arachnoid. Uh, and it does cause inter increased intracranial pressure uh, or increased pressure in the brain, swelling. If you're young, you have in ICP, uh, increased ICP from a head injury, they'll put a bolt in your head and evacuate, they can evacuate that blood or they can monitor the ICP. Uh, if you're old, then they probably won't necessarily do that. I mean like old, like you know, be old. Here's just a picture of the, the like the subdural hematoma here. Uh, you can see this really well on a CT, that's why all these patients, you know, the, they call that code stroke, they take them right to CT. It's because of the, you don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, they, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the bleed. They're looking for a head bleed. Same way in trauma, they're looking for the head bleed when they take them to CT. They want to make sure they don't have uh, a head bleed. Yeah. So could be cute. Most of all the subdural bleeds that I've seen have been really slow in onset. Like the next the, the next day, they started developing those. Like we spoke of, epidural bleeds will be uh, very quick in onset. Most of the time, these are severe because the of the, uh, the the amount of blood loss. You know, the subdural bleed is a, a venous bleed. This is a arterial bleed. So the uh, like in all head injuries, sort of a late signs, they these bone pupils, vital signs start to decrease. Maybe get that Cushing's triad, and then to give you an example where it causes this artery, causes this fracture, it, it lacerates this, this artery. Okay. Laceration, of course, to the, to the scalp, it's a, like we looked at, it's a, just a soft tissue injury. This would be also a laceration to the, to the brain, the actual organ is lacerated. You know, like that depressed skull fracture, it lacerated the brain. Okay. All, all these injuries are going to be very similar in signs and symptoms, okay? So really your, your goal is in a head injury, ALS, uh, recognition, rapid transport. Okay. So size it up. Make sure that you don't, since we never assume, okay, or we try very hard never to assume, you can get into that rut, you know. This guy. I think that has happened to me before. I thought the guy was intoxicated. Okay, and man, he was combative. He was fighting us the whole way. I thought he was looking. I thought he was just intoxicated. It ended up. I felt bad for a little bit. Not long though, but it ended up he had a head injury. And that's why he was so combative. But he couldn't feel pain. I held his hand all the way to the ER to try to get him to stop 
being chosen. I mean, he was pulling the seat collar off and the HID. He wanted to fight. He wanted to do all this stuff. So I just held his hand all the way to the ER, and it didn't even phase him. You know, the thumb. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so watch that. Everybody can fall into that rut. You know, you just think, well, this guy, because he he'd been drinking. He smelled like a brewery. So, you know, we just we thought, oh boy, it's just intoxicated until we looked at the CT. And actually, had a head injury. Things to look at that will probably, like on your size up, that will probably indicate more than likely, you know, at least some force, a starred window. It gets the, that term because it sort of stars that, it sort of fractures that windshield out. It takes a lot of force to hit this windshield. You know, we see them on TV when they, uh, you know, they use your elbow or something like that and they hit in the middle of the window and knock the window out. That would break that person's arm, elbow. It would destroy it. Okay. Uh, I don't know about a side window, but a back window or something like that. I could probably hit it with this golf club and not really go through the window like that. You have to hit it in a certain spot. If I hit it in the corner, then it would it would fracture the way it's supposed to and break. But a window in the and a, especially a front window, a windshield, is very hard. And so the, it, it takes a lot of force to do that. But you just don't hit a window. A uh, buddy of mine got locked out of the, his car when we were deer hunting one time. Short of shooting his window out, I hit it full bore with the, the butt of my gun like this. And it went gray. The gun just bounced off of it. And so... They're, they're hard. It takes a lot of, lot of energy, a lot of force to do that. So that's starring, starring window where maybe the patient's seatbelt failed him or he wasn't restrained and he came up and he, he hit his forehead on the, on the windshield. Hit the bat, frontal impact. This happens a lot, slips and falls, okay, with, with head injuries. Uh, the definitely like fo football, any, anything contact-wise that, that you could have would, would, would cause it as well. So you look at these mechanism of injuries. A simple fall, too. Uh, remember one guy who fell and he was out checking his mail and he fell. He slipped and hit his head on the, sort of on his porch there. And uh, it ended up killing him. Oh. The, the head injury did, yeah. He just he fell from a standing position and hit his head on his porch and the concrete and killed him later. All right. So always especially make sure that you do good spinal mobilization, evaluate the need for oxygen, okay? Jaw thrust, if they're asking you to open the airway. In any trauma patient, make sure that it's jaw thrust, right? We don't do a head tilt, chin lift. And we see these different indicators of minimal chest wall movement or just poor tidal volume, uh, slow rate, you know, someone breathing four or five times per minute, we reduce positive pressure ventilation or, you know, bag valve mask. Uh, so hope, hope they're spine in line. Uh, you know, this goober is listening for respirations, but someone would take a stethoscope and listen for breath sounds, okay? All right. Uh, you, oh, that's pretty cool. So, spatial injuries here. A lot, a lot of blood can get into the back of the airway. The, uh, we had a guy one time, he was repoing a car by himself, which most of the time that's what happens. In the chain, this chain, he was pulling the, the car up on broke and it hit him in the cheek. And you could literally see, you could pull his cheek apart and see inside of his mouth. Okay? The reason I tell you this is because here, here comes the kicker for a BLS thing. 
he needed to be ventilated and suction, right? I mean, he's, he's just blood just pouring out of his mouth and his cheek, right? We can't ventilate him sitting up. We have to lay him down. What's the problem with laying this guy down? Yeah, he, all of a sudden all that blood goes back. So you're like suctioning like crazy and you're still trying to ventilate this guy. And uh, it creates quite a problem on the BLS side. Not necessarily for us. We gave him some medicine to stop his breathing and we paralyzed him and we could ventilate him then. But it was, even though it broke his jaw, it was still rather a hard intubation because of, of all the blood from the back of uh, from gather in the back of the throat. So this is a huge problem here with, with blood okay. going into the back of the throat and trying to get the guy, you know, laid down, calm down. Life, better life through pharmacology. Okay. Use your APU, you know, same as always, Glasgow Coma Scale. My recommendations for uh, testing purposes is to be very familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, when you get out and you start using this stuff, then you can uh, do as I do. You look at a chart. Uh, I can, if you gave me numbers I, or signs and symptoms and, and different things, I couldn't tell you. I don't know the Glasgow Coma Scale. It's, I can look at a chart now. When I had to test EMT, I had to memorize it. We memorized it, okay? But I'm saying be very familiar with it. Uh, if, if you do ever get a question, they're going to give you signs and symptoms, responsiveness, and uh, you have to figure out the Glasgow Coma Scale. Remember, I open a verbal response. <clears throat> so what I would know is what's really bad, like three is the lowest, and then what is it? Uh, 6, 10, 15 is the highest, okay? I would know that. And so, is there disoriented? So you're, you're familiar with this, inappropriate. So you, you know that's gonna be less than 15, okay? So I would be that sort of familiar with it that way, okay? Unless you just wanna memorize it for the, for the test. That might be better. But you're, you have so many other things going in your head, right? I'd just be familiar with it. Right, you need some oxygen. Uh, examine the head. I already spoke about that. Uh, impelled object, what do we do with it? Leave it there. Admire it. Don't take pictures, you lose your job. With the, uh, uh, Make a little slant out of something, immobilize it. Okay. Check check the pupil response, especially in head injuries, trauma. Remember our medical assessment, you don't necessarily need to check pupil response, right? But trauma you would you would always do that, especially if you suspect a head injury. Uh, maintain C spine. Always uh, work on that. CMS check, all four extremities. Okay. Uh, head injuries are almost always critical, so reassess every five minutes. Definitely keep an eye on the, on the blood pressure. Remember, the pressure is going to, you know, and in shock, you have a late sign. The blood, blood pressure changes uh, sort of as a late sign. In a head injury, it can change relatively quick because of the, the cushion's triad. So you need to monitor, get a good baseline on on the blood pressure, the pulse, the respirations, okay? Like we're talking about here, this is just talking about that Cushing's triad, get bradycardic with it. Different respiratory patterns, Cheyenne Stokes, okay? Just seeing where we have rate of 20, Okay, I highlight that because if it ever becomes a test question, then this is where they're getting it from. Okay, they, they want you to ventilate this patient at 20. They consider 20 is hyperventilation.
Always get as much information as you can. Don't delay transport. Try to get information. Rapid, in trauma, key term, rapid transport. Right? So when you're doing your assessment, I'm going to rapid, rapid transport, rapidly transport. The two types of amnesia we looked at, retrograde, I think I've been actually seeing this backwards for years. Okay, retrograde, can't remember leading up to the incident. Okay, so up to the incident, retrograde. Uh, I'm going to have to look that up. I still think that's, that's backwards. But retrograde, according to this, you can't. They don't remember up to, so if the patient had a car wreck, they don't remember anything up to the car wreck, right? And then, anterior grade, anti-grade, okay? Uh, circumstances after the, the incident. So it goes backwards, right? So they, they lose the uh, you know, person, place, time, and event. And so as the head injury progresses, they lose the event, the time, the place, and then the worst one, they don't know who they are, right? And so as the head injury progresses, it goes, they start losing all this information backwards. Here's a good picture of that bone pupil. Oh, jeez. See how this one seems sort of normal size, but this one's dilated out? Unless they put drops in, you ever go to the eye doctor and they dilate your eyes? So unless they do that, you see this, That would, unless that's normal for the patient for some reason, that's usually a sign, like in a head injury, that's a sign of a brainstem herniation. Then we have the two posturing. This is, most of these, most of these this is decorticate posturing as they turn their hands upward, uh, and the cervic posturing as they sort of turn their hands outward. Both are signs of uh, brainstem injuries. They're different in different areas, but we're gonna keep it real simple and say, hey, th these are brainstem injuries. Again, with this, patients who have been posturing uh, have a very, very poor outcome. I don't think I've ever seen any really survive. Brainstem injuries, people just really don't survive those. Would you, would you move her back, her head back in line, even if it's a brainstem? Yeah, if, if you could. She, she might be all stiff okay. over there. Could you mess up your uh, if you, you uh, if it's a head injury, you probably won't put on a C collar. So, good question. You know, what do you do with that? You you probably try to move it into the midline. That's if it, if it would. Oh, I see what you're saying. You you move it, and all of a sudden you do something else. Right? Too. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that would happen. End her suffering a lot quicker. That's not that's <laughs> we like hanging. You know? Here, I don't want you to suffer. Let me lift your head. It happens, man. Thank you, man. I'm going to lift the I want to do it all day, get it wrong every time. Is it bothering you? Not really. I'm thinking about it. This one? Yeah. Okay. So if I hit that one, you don't have a seizure? No, no. Okay. <laughs> 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 That's so bad. That falls down. Yeah. Okay, let's change class to seizures. <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. Do we move her neck? <laughs> in the, please, end the, please end the suffering. Okay, so do good assessment. Uh, if they're bleeding from 
not bleeding, but if they have drainage coming from the ears or the nose, cerebral spinal fluid or blood, don't try to stop that. Okay? It's, it's sort of like a pressure valve. It's allowing the, let it leak out to decrease the pressure. Okay, or, or help decrease the pressure. Don't stop the flow out of the ears or nose. And then rapid transport. Always be prepared for seizures. You know, you get that patient, you get them in the back, you, you, you move that head and all of a sudden, you know, worsen that brain stem injury. And uh, the, then they can start seizing from it. Moving their head wouldn't affect the brain stem. No. If, if they had a high C spine injury, fracture, it would, but the brain stem, no. It, it's just, it doesn't herniate like that far out. So. If we make it worse, then the safety. Yeah, you don't know, it makes it worse. <laughs> okay. They're, they're critical, reassess every five minutes, look for. Uh, just look for these trends, okay? Uh, like we talked about at the beginning of all this, recognition is huge as far as head injuries are concerned. Unless it's soft tissue, uh, I mean, a lot of people survive from head injuries. I, I, I've known people survive from subdural bleeds and, 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 and different head injuries, different bleeds like that. But it always affects so they have lasting effects from it like subdural bleeds one of the common lasting effects is uh, they they lose uh, long-term memory you know so uh, di different things like that they they can lose long-term memory anyway it, it's always any questions head injuries okay good Okay.